All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, happy to be speaking to an individual coming off of a big victory at Ryzen 17, winner via corner stoppage over the well-regarded Satoru Kideoka, and a presumably happy Johnny Case on the show today. How's it going there, man? <laughs> it's going good, man. Happy indeed. Happy indeed. And what are your thoughts on your performance overall, just in terms of, I guess, what you were able to do out there? And like I said, you know, pretty big name value sort of opponent, and you had a pretty comprehensive performance against him. Could it have gone any better? No, I mean, yeah, of course, he was a legend, and uh, we knew he was going to be a warrior. And, you know, he, he definitely was a warrior. But um, to be honest, no, I wasn't really surprised with my performance. I knew we were going to go out there and we were going to get the win. Not because I'm, you know, so much better than my opponent. It's just because of the preparation that we we put in to this fight and, uh, you know, the years leading up to this fight. You know, I feel like I'm in the best, uh, the best of my career, and, um, you know, I'm only getting better and better and better. So the, the win was kind of expected. Yeah, and where does this rank for you in terms of, like, I guess, like, statement wins that you've had over the course of your career? Or do you not necessarily look at fights through that kind of lens and you just kind of, like, focus on, like, one task at a time and each is its own unique experience? Yeah, I kind of I kind of, kind of, just focus on each fight as, as it is. You know, I don't really have a lot of, like, fights where I think, like, oh, man, this is, like, my, my best accomplishment. Uh, you know, like, I think, you know, maybe, like, when I was younger in my career, going from the amateurs to the to the professionals and then you know again when yeah that's about it you mean because i thought you know like fighting prestigious you know uh organizations doesn't necessarily mean it is the toughest you know or the best accomplishments you know um i've had some of the better some of my toughest fights that you know were in front of 500 people so um this this fight was just uh it was you know it was a worthy opponent but um it was you know my preparation and my hard work <clears throat> it's just another fight you know yeah, just different chapters in the story, you know, like you can have a moment where you're out there like fighting in Japan and stuff like that. And then also, you know, when you won your first professional title for Midwest Cage Championships, you know, they're both just different experiences. Exactly, exactly that, man. And I'm kind of wondering who you were getting in that work with at MMA Lab, like in terms of regular sparring partners, because it seems like there's some real high level fighters there, but it also seems like a great, you know, friendly rapport and kinship among everybody at the MMA Lab. So can you talk about like who you're regularly working like, and getting that, you know, regular sparring with ahead of training camps and stuff like that for sure for sure so the mma lab um i actually i did all my camp at extreme couture i actually i made the move i live in las vegas now but the mma lab is my family but um you know my main training partner there was benson anderson uh countless hours <laughs> countless hours and rounds spent with that guy you know and just everybody in that room is just such such good people and there's so much talent in that room um, but I, yeah, but I actually live in Las Vegas. Uh, I met my girlfriend, Emily Whitmire, who's also a strawweight, uh, fights in the UFC. And, um, we ended up, uh, getting a house together in Las Vegas, Nevada and train out at Extreme Couture. So, uh, both gym and both gyms, both coaches, uh, you know, they respect each other. And, and um, you know, I'm always going back to the lab and seeing my friends training there. Um, as well as, you know, I have teammates from the lab come when they're in Vegas, they, they stop out my train at Extreme Couture, so uh, that, that relationship works really well, and my camp was fucking awesome, this camp, you know, so can't say enough good things about both gyms. Yeah, it sounds like you're getting a best of both worlds kind of situation. Like, it seems like you still have a good rapport with the guys at MMA Lab, but getting in that base work at Extreme Couture. And I imagine it's pretty good because I was seeing an interview where you were talking about making, like, I think, like a four and a half hour commute so you could, like, see your girlfriend and stuff like that. So it seems a little more agreeable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot better out. <laughs> it's a lot better, uh, you know, living under one roof for sure. And I want to talk about the rise and fight a bit further, too, because there's implications even beyond just the victory itself, you know, getting a spot in that lightweight Grand Prix and everything like that. And it seems like there's some big names slated for that Grand Prix. How excited are you to be a part of a tournament structure for a promotion like Ryzen going forward and, you know, mingling with other promotions and stuff like that? So you're really getting some of the best fighters in the world. Yeah, man, that, and that, I'm really looking forward to it. You know what I mean? Uh, the Grand Prix, <clears throat> when there was talks of the Grand Prix back in, uh, you know, January or whatever and um you know I knew right away that that was my that was my title you know I just gotta I just gotta go through the formalities of um you know winning the fights to get there but you know my preparation and like just everything has been gearing up to this moment you know when I was released from the UFC I thought it was you know one of the worst things that ever happened to me but you know in hindsight it's always 2020 and it, it turned out to be one of the best things that's ever happened to me you know because now I'm in line to fight for a world title um, that Patricky Pitbull, uh, 
uh, Bellator, former Bellator champion. Um, there's rumor he's going to be in the tournament as well. So, you know, for me, like, to be able to fight and, and be a, a true world champion, someone who's actually tested and, and, and been there and he's done that, it just doesn't get any better for me, you know. It really puts my name in the mix and really staples me in, in the books for, you know, one of the best lightweights of this time. So that really is just that there's all that all that matters to me right now is just wearing that gold belt around my waist. Yeah, and I get what you mean, like, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty and all of that, because, like, getting released from the UFC, probably not the greatest feeling at the time, but, you know, going 3-0-1 and one since, you know, leaving the UFC and everything like that, just the undefeated run, and fighting for multiple promotions as well, from what I was noticing. I noticed you had a PFL fight in there, and I was noticing your finishing rate as well, which is at 85%, so probably lends itself well to scoring a lot of points within the, you know, PFL tournament structure and just, like, how they've instantiated the rules. Is there any chance in the future, like, far off, where maybe you would go with PFL for another season and try to operate in that tournament structure? Because it seems like your fighting style is, you know, pretty favorable for that. For sure. So it, tur- so it turned out I, I was a last-minute replacement in the PFL tournament. I ended up uh, advancing to the tournament as a, as a number eight seed, and then I ended up uh, having a draw with uh, the, the champion of PFL, that Natan Schultz. Um, and, you know, through the formality of that tournament, he won the first round, I won the second round, and whoever wins the first round advances in the tournament. So he advanced, I didn't make it. And then after the season, I was only supposed to have one fight with Ryzen. I was supposed to pick up another win with Ryzen and then get back with the PFL tournament. I ended up fighting Yasuki Yachi and uh, beating him and then ended up signing multiple deal with Ryzen. So it ended up working out, you know, fighting for a world title as well. But, um, you know, after I win this title with Ryzen, it really comes down to who's going to pay the most. You know what I mean? I'll be, you know, I'll be whatever. What is it? One, two, three, four. So I'll be seven, seven and zero since being released from the UFC. And uh, you know, I feel like that makes me pretty marketable. And we'll just see who wants to uh, who wants to offer the most. You know, and that's that's you know inevitably where I'm going to end up. Yeah, for sure. So I'm wondering then what the nature of your Ryzen deal is then. Presumably you've signed some sort of multi-fight contract if you're going to be, you know, potentially going through a sort of Grand Prix structure that would be multiple fights. So are you presently signed within like a multi-fight deal with Ryzen? I am. Yep, I am. Yeah, and I mean, I definitely think it would set you up in a pretty good way. So, I mean, would it be a situation where you'd entertain taking, like, crossover fights with Bellator then or kind of just, like, win the belt and rise in and then sort of just, like, you know, court every promotion, see what free agency holds for you and kind of get a sense of what your worth is? No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I only plan on fighting for the most prestigious, whether that be Ryzen, Bellator, UFC, PFL. Um, you know, like, that's... I want to fight the best guys in the world, you know. I don't want to just um you know you know just collect wins here and there i want to, i want to test myself you know i want to be a champion and uh, i also want to make money so um yeah I, I i would love to fight bellator i'd love to fight you know psl ryzen even the ufc you know if they want to they want to offer it but um i just uh, my goal is now to be a world champion and then we'll, we'll take it from there yeah and i can't imagine ufc wouldn't be interested in that i mean you went four and two in the promotion itself so had a good record there for sure but I was also noticing that you seem like a pretty big fan of like pride back in the day and just the Japanese MMA rule set and everything like that so you must be excited to compete in that kind of framework but I also noticed you got a victory on New Year's Eve and there's such like a tradition of those big like New Year's Eve shows in Japan was there any kind of special significance performing on that kind of stage for you oh man I love it I absolutely been a fan like you know going back to when I first got introduced in MMA I was uh I was like in sixth grade, I think. I was uh, I was wrestling at the AAU State Wrestling Tournament, and I remember seeing this fighting on TV. And it, you know, they were fighting in a boxing ring, but they had these small gloves on, and they would go to the ground and fight. And I just remember just being so in awe about it, you know, and not knowing what it was. Turns out later, you know, I ended up fighting out. It was Pride, and it was uh, Don Fry versus uh, you know, a legendary legendary fight where they just like it was like a hockey fight. You know, what I mean, they just clenched on each other, just punched each other, punched each other, punched each other. I forget who the Japanese fighter was. But yeah, Fry Takayama, yeah. Fight. Yeah, you know what fight I'm talking about. Yeah. So I ended up watching that fight, and it just I, I've been such a fan of pride, you know, in the, in the rule set of, like, the stomps and the soccer kicks on the ground. And, uh, and so just to be able to finally be able to fight that has just been, like, like a dream come true, you know, like a big legend come true. And, uh, you know, not to mention that the Asian MMA fans, the Asian MMA fans are the, some of the best fighters.
or some of the best fans, most educated in the entire world. And so, uh, you know, going over there and fighting for those guys is just it's, it's amazing, you know? Is it a weird dynamic to be fighting to a crowd that's, like, largely quiet throughout the course of the fight and then has these, like, huge roars for distinct moments in the fight as compared to, say, fighting in North America where there's there's this constant scent of people being loud and raucous? <laughs> yeah, in a way, in a way. It just it goes to show just the level of education, though. You know what I mean? Uh, not to talk shit about American fans, but the majority of them don't really know what the fuck they're watching half the time. You know, I think they, they kind of Fair enough. pro wrestling, and all they want to see is is guys getting knocked out. And you know what I mean, they don't really understand the intricacies of the sport. Whereas Asia, everybody knows. You know, they're super educated. They they're super respectful of every aspect of the fight, not just the knockout. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely makes a big difference, you know. Um, and just, but even though it is quiet in that arena over in Japan, the energy is just through the roof, man. Like you would never, you you would never understand what I. You could never even be able to explain it unless you've actually been there and experienced it, you know. So I definitely, it's definitely a different change, like with the the roar of the crowd, but uh, the energy is unmatched in, in Asia over in Ryzen. Yeah, and, you know, like, some wrestling experience when you're younger and everything like that, so favoring, you know, certain grappling in particular fights. I guess I'm kind of wondering, in a general sense, like, fighting in a ring with Ryzen as compared to fighting in some of the other promotions you've fought in. Is there any kind of difference in your methodology? Does your approach have to change? Because it seems like in, like, a generalized kind of way that sometimes it's a bit harder for grapplers to get things going on in a ring, and then maybe it kind of, like, favors the striking end of things. Do you think it changes your fighting methodology at all to be competing in a ring as compared to a cage, or is it the same across the board? No, absolutely. It completely changes the fight. You know what I mean? The cage is, is another element of the fight, you know, and it's, it's used for, you know, you can press your opponents up on the cage and, and cook them and make them tired, or if you're down on the ground, you can use the cage to climb back up to your feet. Uh, in the ropes, you don't have that ability, you know what I mean? Um, but what you do have when you fight in the ropes it gets you closer to the body for body lock. So if you're against the ropes, you can, you know, you reach through and grab the body and take down to there too. So there are some, some disadvantages, but there's also some advantages. So it just completely, it just changes the fight. You know what I mean? So, uh, definitely. And I think in Japan, they don't, I think they, they, they really, they look for the finish, whether that's a knockout or a submission. You know what I mean? They, they don't really like guys who go out there and, take them down and grind them out and kind of that Randy Couture style of uh, fighting. I mean, push them on the cage and, and wear them out and beat them like that. You know, they, they want the clean death. They want a knockout or a submission. So I think that's kind of the main difference between why they, why they choose to fight in the ring still versus fighting in a cage. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of wondering, like, if there's an ideal strength of schedule you'd want for the remainder of the year. Like, is there a certain amount of fights you'd like to get going forward? Do you want to just get on, I guess, every rising card going forward? Or, like, kind of, what do you want to do on that end of things? Yeah, no, in a perfect world, man, I'd love to fight every weekend. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, if I'm healthy and, and uh, if I'm healthy and I got an opponent who's willing, man, I'd rather just keep stacking these chips, keep raking in these wins, and, and keep keep building my fan base you know so uh you know i've never been afraid of a fist fight and uh in fact i kind of look forward to it you know it's a lot like christmas morning in a way yeah for sure i imagine it's a uh, you know quite an interesting feeling getting out there just the hyper focus of being in a situation like that but in the preparatory stages i'm kind of wondering if there's any like go-to music you train to like any artists or genres or anything like that or are you one of those fighters that kind of you know trains in relative silence to kind of replicate the conditions of fight night uh, yeah, to, to an extreme, though. The, the music really depends on, uh, on where I'm at, like, in my life. You know, I listen to all kinds of music, so country music to rap to rock to everything, man. So, you know, reggae, everything. So it really just kind of comes down to how my soul is feeling at the time, you know, and kind of what I'm jiving with. But uh, as far as my training and my preparation, uh, yes, I, I always try to replicate as close to the fight as possible, you know, whether that's training around the time I'll fight, uh, the music intro I'm going to use to, you know, whatever, whatever, whether, whether I'm going to, you know, look to finish the fight in later rounds, look to finish the fight coming out hot, you know, that definitely all my, all plays into my training. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of wondering, like, are you still digging the kombucha? I noticed you had that Tapuat Brewing Co. shout out there. So are you still, is that still your favorite kombucha? You switched up the probiotics a little bit. Where are you at on that? I'm always with kombucha. So actually, my girlfriend Emily actually makes her own kombucha. So oh, cool. Uh, 
I've definitely, yeah, I've kind of been spoiled in that aspect. So, yeah, oh, yeah, I still love my kombucha, but um, more of a homemade guy myself. Oh, that's awesome, man. I didn't know about that. Multi-talented there. You guys are fighters and also making some good kombucha. But you also been great with your time, man. I'm curious if there's anything you want to add as a parting thought as we're wrapping up here. Uh, I just want to say thank you, man. Thank you for the opportunity to use this platform and, and expand my fan base. Um, also, thank you to my sponsors, AZ IV Medics, um, Hemp Cafe Tokyo, uh, Elixinol, CBD, I want to say thank you to everyone and my coaches and everyone and my teammates at Extreme Vitual and the MMA Lab. And uh, if you guys want to follow me on my social media, hit me up on Hollywood Case on my Instagram and Twitter, and then follow my fan page on Facebook at Johnny Hollywood Case. Hollywood taking over Japan, big victory at Ryzen 17, and fans definitely have to follow along as the Ryzen lightweight Grand Prix starts fleshing itself out and kind of rolling on through. Thanks for all the time and insights, Johnny, and hope you enjoy the rest of your night, man. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it.